Demmels is our speaker today. He has been a, a Deschutes County prosecutor for over 28 years, grew up in the area, actually graduated from Redmond High. <laughs> Lots of people will be happy about that in this room. And uh, he graduated from OSU, so about half the room last week was two ducks, today one beaver. Uh, and then he went on to uh, law school at Georgetown University. His, uh, he wanted to become a lawyer because his parents said he liked to debate and argue a lot when he was younger. I feel like I should have had both my kids go into that line. He has served uh, for over 20 years in the family drug court as well. And uh, when he was elected, he said that the most important things are prosecuting major crimes such as murder, uh, child abuse, domestic abuse, fentanyl crimes, trafficking. In addition to participating in various outreach programs, he serves as a frequent lecturer at law enforcement community colleges and high schools around the area. He also was a recipient of the Champion of Victims' Right Award in 2021. I'll turn it over to you. There's a class for that. <laughs> so I'm Steve Gunnels. I'm the district attorney for Deschutes County, and I've been the elected district attorney for just over a year now. Uh, I've been with the Deschutes County District Attorney's Office for 30 years now, and uh, right from law school, I came back home as quickly as I could from the East Coast, and uh, no offense to them but uh, I wasn't staying there. And uh, I've been at the Deschutes County DA's office for my entire professional career. During that time, I've prosecuted everything from uh, misdemeanor shoplifting to aggravated murder. And I, I love my job. I love being a prosecutor. I love doing what I do. And so that's why I ran for DA. I, I have an obligation to this community, I have an obligation to that office to be the district attorney uh, so that uh, I think that, that the office can be run in a way that is public safety focused and is uh, efficient with your money. So that's what I'm trying to do in the DA's office currently. Uh, our Mission statement is something that took some work uh, to really boil down what I believe about being a prosecutor. It's the mission of the Deschutes County District Attorney's Office to seek justice, advance public safety, and uphold the law. We strive to maintain public trust and serve the people of Deschutes County with fairness, integrity, and honor. Those are all the values that I, or many of the values that I, uh, that I hold dear as a prosecutor. and. It's, um, and so that's, that's our mission, and that's what every employee in the DA's office knows, because they, every employee in the DA's office has that mission on the front door of our office. Every time they walk through the door, they see it. Uh, they also have a sticker on the back of their, their pass cards with that mission statement on it, and it's on a number of the, the um, documents that we have in the office that they see on a regular basis so that they can kind of adhere to those values. Okay. One of the specialty programs that we run in the DA's office is the Veterans Intervention Strategy. It is designed to get veterans who have become, the, the current phrase is justice involved. Uh, it's, a little bit, it's a heavy euphemism. Uh, really what it means is people who commit crimes and get caught up in the criminal justice system after having committed a crime. But uh, if, there, if, if, here we go, here's my IT going again. So, I know enough to say don't scan. Just click on the background. Okay. Uh, so, the idea here is to try to get veterans who commit 
low to medium level crimes hooked up with treatment providers, mental health, substance abuse, those are typically the, the kinds of treatment that, that veterans are in need of when they get involved in the criminal justice system. And really the idea here is to get them back on track because they, every uh, veteran who's eligible was either, either received a general discharge or an honorable discharge, and which means that at some point in their life they have their act together and they can get it back together if, you know, with the right resources and prodding and a judge telling them you need to, uh, and they do. And we've had very good success with that program, getting veterans back on track, uh, you know, just kind of uh, working through the bureaucracy that veterans have to deal with, with the Veterans Administration, um, and medical uh, bureaucracy especially. That's been, a, I know, a big challenge to get that to work right for veterans. But uh, the idea here is that we get uh, people to, uh, who are veterans to be productive members of society again, to be parents to their children and good spouses to their uh, husbands or wives. And, uh, and we've had ex really excellent success, very low recidivism rate. We've only had one graduate of the program recidivate, commit another crime afterwards, and that's a phenomenal rate for the, the uh, population that we're dealing with who are addicted to drugs or alcohol or what have you, or uh, extreme PTSD due to their service. So that's the program, and I know I'm on a time crunch because you all have to get back to work. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is some of the trends, or some of you have to get back to work. <laughs> the ones who are laughing at that obviously don't. They're, they're going to go cut a few after this. So one of the things that we've seen uh, as a trend here in Deschutes County and really around the country in the last four to five years uh, is an increase in the number of mental health related cases and drug abuse cases and the connection between drug use and mental health in the criminal justice system. And uh, those numbers are, for us, kind of off the charts. We've had a doubling in the number of what's called aid and assist cases in Deschutes County since 2020. And this is <coughs> the chart that's up there now. If you can see that, it doesn't look like a, a huge increase by the graph. But, that's, but the number literally is double on an active basis what it was in 2020 and prior to that. And it's been, it was creeping up to that before. And then COVID happened, uh, which was a little bit of an impetus, I think, to people who were mentally ill becoming uh, a little bit more mentally ill, and then also drug use. And drug use is, was related to some of the things that were going on in the, in the country, but especially in Oregon. Uh, the, the increase in drug use, uh, I attribute largely to Measure 110 the ballot uh, measure that decriminalized the possession of small amounts, user amounts, let's say, of drugs. And that increase in drug use has led to an increase in mental illness in the community. People who are mentally ill or prone to mental illness who use certain classes of drugs are very vulnerable to getting pushed over the edge into psychosis, into you know, really debilitating mental illness. And that's what we've seen in the criminal justice system. And we've seen uh, that in extreme ways and in ordinary criminal ways as well. I'll show you some of those numbers as well. In Deschutes County, so these are the numbers of cases filed by year overall. And so typically before 2019. 2019 is the last normal year for statistics. Uh, in 2020, uh, everything in criminal justice, at least, maybe everywhere, just changed. The stats, you can't compare 2019 to any to the, af the years after that, except in seeing wild variation. And so in prior to 20, uh, 20 in 2019 and prior, we filed 5,000 criminal cases a year. In 2020, that number dropped very dramatically. It dropped for a couple of different reasons. One is that Measure 110 
went into effect, although it went into effect late in the year. So the number of possession, drug possession charges dropped, uh, but also DUIs dropped very dramatically. And does anybody have any ideas why DUIs would drop in 2020? Staying at home. Staying at home. The bars were shut down. Oh, it was. It was. I don't want to. I don't want to bring back bad memories. But that's. That's what. That's what happened. People were still driving drunk. Cops weren't even giving tickets at that time. Three years they stopped giving tickets. Yeah. They. Um, well, poli police were. I think police were enforcing the law, but people were staying home more. Uh, bars were shut down, so people were drinking at home driving less, and so relatively it was, uh, it was, uh, there were less citations being issued uh, for DUI. Uh, that number though bounced back in 2021 and is uh, back to normal. We file over a thousand DUI cases per year in Deschutes County and always have except in 2020 and until we, until we got back to normal. Uh, so a thousand DUIs in Deschute, little old Deschutes County is a ridiculous number. Yes, sir. How many of those are repeat offenders? Of a thousand? How many? Are oh, about twenty percent of those are repeat offenders. Most are di the the majority of them are diversion eligible, uh, which means it's their first offense within fifteen years. So that's what I guess that's what I mean by repeat. There are there are many people who. <laughs> Who have multiple DUIs, but can, but can get a diversion because they, their last DUI was 20 years ago. There are many of those as well, but uh, those are less common. There are a lot of first-time DUI offenders, and then there are some who get seven, eight, nine DUIs in their in their careers. So these, this is the, the stat that, that kind of demonstrates the effect of Measure 110. You'll see on the left uh, that, that those are heroin prosecutions, heroin charges filed, possession of heroin charges filed. It was 257 in 2019, and it was six last year in Deschutes County. And that's not because we're... <coughs> not filing the ones that are coming across our desk. Those are the ones that are coming across our desk. Uh, in, and in 2019, we filed 633 methamphetamine possession charges. And last year, it was 10% of that. It was 62 <coughs> methamphetamine possession charges. Uh, and the reason for that is that Measure 110 made those, for the methamphetamine at least, made those 570 or so methamphetamine possession cases not criminal. So they became essentially legalized because Measure 110, what Measure 110 did is it uh, turned that drug possession charge from a either a misdemeanor or a felony into a violation. It's a Class E violation, which was a new category of violation. And the maximum penalty was a $100 fine a person could make a phone call to a treatment provider to get out of the $100 fine or just not show up to court and the judge would impose a $100 fine that the person would never have to pay and there was no consequence for it. So in terms of accountability for conduct, that, that uh, plan is terrible. It doesn't work. Yes, sir? If, if Measure 110 is finally reversed, what's the scenario? Looking at total all DUIs, how do you compare the alcohol one to all the other? Uh, drug, for, drug between drug alcohol. between drug and alcohol. So under uh, so typically, what we see nowadays is the alcohol is by far the the heaviest number within DUIs. It's it's over fifty percent of the DUIs are alcohol, and then you have you also have background marijuana in a big portion, probably 30 to 40 percent of those cases have at least background marijuana in addition to alcohol. It, it will show up on a urine test, something like that. Uh, but then you also have in about 10 percent or less of the cases you have polydrug. You have alcohol, you have marijuana, you have amphetamines, you have 
uh, you have uh, tranquilizers, you have you name it. And you know, people driving around on the street, I've always said that the, the biggest threat to you and your family is DUIs, that people who are driving around uh, out of their minds on substances who are just in the car that just passed you on Highway 97 or on your, on your uh, side street that you, where you live, you don't know what they're carrying, what they've got on board, and oftentimes it's, it's enough to, to cause a crash if you're not careful. So that's, you really need to be careful about other drivers always. Uh, highway 97 just passed Highway 101 as the most deadly highway in Oregon, uh, which is embarrassing because it, like compared to Highway 101, which is a kind of an inherently dangerous highway if you look at how it's built. Uh, like highway 97 is a pretty straight shot. The only reason, the only reason for the, the high fatalities is excessive speed, ex excessive aggressive driving, stupid passing, and intoxicated drivers. And so that's, that's where we're at. Of course, we do, we do also have ice on our roads. Don't, they don't have there so much. But most of those deaths are most of those deaths are from uh, speed. Okay. So these are the overall charges that are filed year over year. You'll see that huge drop in 2020 on DUIs on the left side of your screen. Uh, it, it dropped down to nothing and then bounced back up, and it's it's going to be over a thousand for the rest of my life. It'll probably someday be over 2,000 here. But it's a, uh, it, to me it's an embarrassment that we have that many DUIs in Deschutes County. And it's, uh, part of it's a testament to how good law enforcement is at interdicting it, finding it on the roads, but a big part of it is the culture we have here of people thinking that they can drink to the point of, or use drugs to the point of intoxication and still get in their cars and go. Do you think our per capita numbers are measurably worse than other places they, that have similar numbers of you know, bars per capita? Or? Well, yeah, the bars per capita is a thing, but um, the, we, are, we are above average nationally for DUIs, and we're above average in Oregon. There are, there are some places that, are, that have worse DUI numbers per capita than we do, but, but we're, for, for as, um, affluent and um, big as this county is, you know, just the physical size of this county, uh, with the population we have, the, the numbers are probably 25% higher than they should be if we were just going to be at, at average for, for uh, DUIs. There's a big, and as we all know, there's a big part of our culture here that is about the going out to the, the bar and taking the, the 20 mile drive home or what, what have you, to get back home after being at the bar all night. Uh, and that's, that's a big part of the problem. So this is the number that keeps literally keeps me up at night. Uh, in 2019, we had one murder in Deschutes County. And historically, in Deschutes County, the, the standard deviation was one. So you would, you would typically expect to have a murder in Deschutes County per year. If, it, if you had zero, and we had many years with zero during my career, it was just a good year where you didn't have one. In bad years, we would have two murders, and it, and it was a little bit jarring when we would have two murders. And then 2020 happened, and we had four. Uh, 2020, we thought it was an anomaly. We thought it was related to COVID and uh, people who are mentally ill being cooped up. And it, they all uh, happened during the summer, essentially, to, to fall period right after the lockdowns. And then uh, 2021 happened, and it was four again. And then 2022 happened, and it was eight. We had eight murders in Deschutes County. That number is not a normal number for us. That's a, that's a wild deviation from where we uh, could expect to be. And then last year we were back to four, which seems to be our our new normal or our plateau. I hope that's wrong. I hope we're back down to 
we've had one this year in Deschutes County. I hope we don't have any more, obviously, for the rest of the year, and that we don't have any more for many years and to, so that we can get back to normal Deschutes County, people not killing each other, uh, which is really a low bar to, to hope for or to expect. Um, I attribute this because I know the facts in each of these murder cases, in virtually every one of them, you've got a combination of drug use, alcohol use, mental Ill and mental illness, and, and, a, and in many of those, a combination of all of those things. Uh, and so that, that, I believe, is a function of the things that, that happened in 2020 that really changed the kind of the dynamic among people who are using drugs and people who are mentally ill and people who are both. And, and that's a uh, topic that I think needs to be addressed more uh, aggressively by the legislature, for example. Uh, the legislature recently amended ballot measure 110 to recriminalize possession of drugs, the hard drugs, so that starting on September 1st, possession of the smaller amounts of drugs will be a crime again that the police can interact with the person and get them directed into treatment into, or into court so that the judge can order them into treatment. That's an old model. That's the, that's the traditional model of getting people into treatment who are, who are using hard drugs in public or get caught using drugs. Uh, but it's a model that works a whole lot better than Measure 110 worked. It doesn't work perfectly. It doesn't even work that well to get people into treatment, to get their lives turned around. But it works a heck of a lot better than doing nothing, which is what Measure 110 did. And so the, my idea of, of <coughs> fixing the, the, uh, the Measure 110 problems that we're seeing is greater accountability and getting people who are addicted to drugs, who are mentally ill, in front of a judge, and you know, judges aren't looking to throw them for using drugs. They're not looking to throw them into prison. They're looking to get them into treatment, and that's what that's what I believe needs to happen. They need to be ordered into treatment and held accountable if they don't follow through with it. So that's um, I always like to end my speeches on a. Uh, harsh note, and so that's uh, that. Uh, yes. uh, that uh, spike up to eight murders, did that involve multiple killings at one go, or, or uh, there was there was uh, there were two doubles in okay. that. I thought maybe there were two doubles, so there were six epis uh, six episodes mm -hmm. of murder. Is that right? Was eight deaths. In, in addition to drugs are associated with all that, uh, are the murders related to domestic violence or family feuds, things of that nature? Uh, we've had, uh, in, within all those murders, we've had two that were domestic violence in the sense that they were adults, adults related by blood living together. There were two murders of adult sons, 40-ish year old sons murdering their mothers with whom they were living. And both of those involved mental illness and drug, alcohol, abuse. Just like all the others. So you've been there with uh, at least four other district attorneys. Um, I'm sure it's been a challenge with the way they have acted in the past, so you had a lot of experience on what to do, not to do. But what in the, in your, uh, in the job is the greatest challenge? Uh, does the co county commissioner support you with your budget, or what is it that you see facing you that's the most difficult? Yeah, uh, I, I don't have any complaints about the way the commissioners support our office. They've been, they've given us when we need something, if we can just explain why we need something, they give you know they give it to us. We don't. Ask, I don't personally ask for a lot. I didn't ask for any additional personnel last year. I will likely ask for one additional prosecutor this year, and that has to do with the number, the increased number of 
mental health cases that we're seeing and the number of <laughs> possession cases that are going to be coming in when Measure 110 gets turned off. Uh, the biggest challenge I face personally is with uh, retaining people in the office. That those of you who are in uh, engaged in the workforce, I think probably are experiencing the same thing. It's really hard to hold on to people. There's so much mobility nowadays. People kind of moving in and out of jobs. Not there aren't a lot of people who want to stay at a job for 30 years, <laughs> like I did. Uh, there are a lot of people who want to dip in, and then there are a lot of people who want to dip in, get some experience, and move on to something else. And that's something that we struggle with in the DA's office. And it's really important that we keep people for a longer period of time so that they can get good at what they do and become good prosecutors who kind of hold the line on cases. That's that's my biggest challenge. Yes, sir. Steve, we keep reading and hearing about a shortage of public defenders for those who can't afford them. Uh, how bad is that situation in Deschutes County? We've been blessed so far uh, with that with that issue, we haven't had any cases dismissed because of lack of a public defender. We've been very close several times, but the same issue I was just talking about, holding on to people, the public defender's office has been bleeding people this year and last, and they're getting to the point where they're gonna have to decline to take cases so if they decline to take cases, then the case can't move forward in the criminal justice system because they need, a, they need a, an attorney to represent them. And those cases will be dismissed if they can't get a public defender on board. We're trying to work with the public defender's office to see how we can help to, uh, to make cases move along so that their, their case numbers don't keep rising. If we can knock down their case numbers a little bit, uh, particularly moving the lower level cases through quickly. We're not going to be giving them sweetheart deals on sex abuse cases or murders, but we can we can be a little bit um, friendlier on the, the lower level cases to move them along while still holding people accountable, uh, just a little bit less. So that's, that's going to be a, a discussion that we're having. Yes, sir? Do you think that the bar exam is going to be removed from requirement for attorneys in Oregon? It is. It, ha it has happened, and I don't. Here? I do not support. I do not support. <laughs> uh, there's a so they the uh, the bar has and the Supreme Court has approved a rule to allow for an alternate way for lawyers to become lawyers to to be members of the bar without taking the bar exam, and it it basically involves doing an internship and practicum and getting getting reviewed by the person or the, the law firm that's that's using them as an intern for a period of time and it's there's a number of hours set and so on. There are some big problems with that I, that I see with uh, taking away a requirement of tested competency to practice law. There are enough mal legal malpractice lawsuits already. Uh, I don't I don't see that taking away that standardized across the board, these are the, these are the standards, do you understand them? The bar isn't that hard, it's, it's not. Uh, so I, uh, I'm not a supporter of that, and it's not just because, well, when I came up, that's not what I did. It's, I, just, I just don't think it's a good idea to take away the standards. I agree, I agree. Is that because they can't pass it? <laughs> that is all tests are racist. That, well, I think, I think the reason, I think the reason is that there are people who are not uh, happy, they don't believe in standardized tests generally, and so that's part of that movement. They, they recently took away the SAT and so on from college applications. But, and, um, but I think it's just a bad idea. I think if you need to modify the way that the bar is written, something like that, to make it uh, fairer, then, then work on that but you need to have a standard. Mm -hmm. And if you can't pass the standard, you shouldn't be able to represent people in a divorce case or in a, a land dispute or anything else, right? Or in, in court representing them if they're charged with a crime. Amen. You need to have a standard. Uh, anyway, that's my, that's my uh, shaking my fist at the clouds moment. Anybody <laughs> has one last question and then we'll... I know this is not your area, but 
What do you think is the cause for the increased uh, drug and alcohol use? Is it uh, lack of well-paying jobs, lack of affordable housing? What do you think? Uh, so my my belief is that if uh, if you take away the um, penalty for breaking the law, which is what Measure 110 did, that increase, uh, the increase we've seen since Measure 110 ended up, went into effect is because there's no, there's no social penalty or there's no actual penalty to breaking the law. It's just, it's a freebie. A lot of people don't break the law because they don't want to get in trouble. A lot of people don't break the law because they don't want to, or they don't want to use drugs because it's going to mess them up and it's going to be bad for them. But there are people who don't, who don't use drugs because it's against the law. And when you make it not uh, not against the law, then those people are have no impediment to using it. So I think there needs to be pressure on people to abide by the law, just like you have a, a speed limit, right? And it's enforced. If it's not enforced, people are going to speed. And, and if you if you don't enforce the law that you claim, which is to say that drugs are illegal, which is is still under Measure 110, drugs are illegal. They're just not enforced because there's no enforcement mechanism left under Measure 110. So that's my, that's my, uh, there's another shaking my hand at the class. <laughs> <laughs> we have a gift for you by a local artesian who won this pen for, thank you for thank you. your time. And Barb's going to get a picture of us if that's okay. Don't That would be a great picture. That would be a great picture. We'll, we'll take that one. <laughs> thank yeah, you very thank much you. for your time. <laughs> and the leadership of others in the room. The challenge of leadership is to be strong but not rude, be kind but not weak, be bold but not bo a bully, be thoughtful but not lazy, be humble but not timid, be proud but not arrogant, have humor but without folly. Jim Ron. With that, I should say Michelle Duff. <laughs>